Hello, my dear viewer. I truly admire those people whose willpower is stronger than granite. These people stand like rocks in a raging ocean, and the waves break against them. It is about such a person that today's story will be about. The hero of this story found himself in a very difficult life situation. He hoped for the help of his beloved wife, but instead received adultery. Let's find out all the details. And while you're watching this video, put your royal like and subscribe to the channel. Let's go. My name is Tim Robinson, and the past year has been a nightmare. There are three main reasons for this. Firstly, more than a year ago, I had a motorcycle accident when a trucker did not notice me on the highway and collided with me. The impact made me unable not only to blink my eyes, but also to breathe. It was difficult for me to eat and drink, as I could only take liquid or mashed food. I couldn't chew, speak, or feel anything from the neck down. The doctors at the hospital said I was lucky to be alive. Thanks to significant compensation from the trucking company, all my medical bills have been paid, and now I receive a monthly allowance that will provide for my wife and me for the foreseeable future. Thanks to my disability income and my wife's earnings, I knew that we would be financially stable. I spent six long months in the hospital before I was allowed to return home, and only then did I discover that my life had become even worse. The consultant looked at me intently and asked, How is that? Unable to contain my shame, I confessed, I can't even bring myself to talk about what has happened in these months. A tear ran down my cheek. It's all right, she reassured me. Your words are safe here. I am here to help you on the path to healing. Nodding, I wiped away my tears and took a sip of water before moving on to the topic of my marriage. I shared with her the story of my marriage to Beth, telling her how we met in college and tied the knot after graduation. At the time of the accident, I was only 25 years old, and we had been married for three years. I worked as a mechanical engineer, and she worked as a paralegal at a well-known law firm in the city. Together, we were able to afford a spacious two-bedroom apartment. Initially, we planned that one of the bedrooms would become a nursery, and the second would serve as a shared office. But after my accident, the nursery was repurposed into my room to accommodate all my medical equipment. During the first month, Beth tried her best to take care of me, but it became obvious that she was not able to handle all my needs, especially when it came to helping in the bathroom. Realizing this, she asked for help. Our neighbors, Don and Katie Aikens, whom we considered friends at the time, offered their help. Don, a lawyer at Beth's firm, often drove her to work, and Katie, a nurse at a nearby hospital, periodically checked on my well-being. She even helped me find a home nurse to take care of me during the day. But after a month, it became clear that Beth was not coping with her duties, despite the help. And then Don got involved? The consultant asked. Yes, it all started innocently, but it was obvious that he had feelings for my wife. She cried a lot and he was there to comfort her. I heard them kissing in the living room on our couch. Then they moved into our bedroom to make love. But it didn't end there, did it? The consultant continued his inquiries. I shook my head and said firmly, no. Later he came into my room and began to mock me telling me about his satisfaction after talking to my wife. I noticed the consultant's expression. I'm really sorry, I said. Where was his wife during all this? The consultant asked. Did she work? Yes, I replied. She often worked odd hours, and often she was out all night. She worked the night shift. I see, the consultant nodded. Please continue. I paused to take a deep breath before continuing. After a month of this relationship, he came into my room while Beth was in the shower. I was so ashamed that I couldn't even speak. Did he bully you? The consultant asked. I nodded silently, wiping away my tears. Yes, I finally managed to say softly. How often did this happen? The consultant asked. I don't know for sure. Maybe several times a week for about four months, I replied. Then the consultant asked, Did your wife know about this? I shrugged my shoulders vaguely. She was never around when it happened, 
She always came in later and talked about how lucky we were to have friends like Dawn to help take care of me. I will always remember the day when he brought the monitor and installed it on my dresser. He hooked him up to a camera and made me watch him make love to my wife. Beth thought it was great that he brought it. When did the bullying finally end? The consultant asked. The day Dr. Steiner visited me, I still remember that day clearly, as if it were yesterday. Beth brought Dr. Steiner and my lawyer to my room shortly after sunrise. Dr. Steiner, a balding elderly man with a German accent, greeted me and introduced his assistant, who had a tablet in his hands. My lawyer, Alan Harrison, was also present. Tim, I'm Dr. Franklin Steiner, he began, and I'm here to talk to you about a possible treatment for your illness. He turned to Beth and said, I'll deal with it further. Please wait in the other room. Beth left the room, but I noticed a note of concern on her face. Then he turned back to me, pulled up a chair, and made eye contact before speaking. So, Tim, let me explain. I head the prestigious Arrowhead Lake Research Center, where we conduct groundbreaking research in the field of three-dimensional bone reconstruction and implants for healing nerve damage. I think your situation is ideal for our services. After reviewing your map, I realized how serious the damage you received, he said. I am sure that we can help you recover a significant part, if not all, of your physical abilities. Would you like to explore this possibility? Please blink once in response to yes and twice in response to no. Naturally, I blinked once. Great, he replied with a grin. It is important to note that this is an experimental process, but we have received permission for human trials. Thanks to the external grants we have received, it will not cost you any money. Although this may be considered experimental, I understand your concerns. Rest assured, if the operation is not successful, you will not be worse off than you are now. I'm sure you're a good candidate, and I think everything will go smoothly. Moreover, I expect you to become even stronger than before the accident if we succeed, as I expect. His explanations gave me hope because he spoke in detail about the procedure. In fact, he suggested replacing the damaged vertebrae with those made of a composite material that is more durable than the original one. These new vertebrae will be created on a 3D printer using data obtained from my own body so that they match the old ones exactly but have additional strength. In addition, he plans to install tiny electronic implants to help heal damaged nerves. The surgery will take three to four hours, and recovery may take several weeks, depending on the speed of my healing. Dr. Steiner has already studied the data on my hospitalization and started designing new bones. I hope you don't mind, he said. But first, we wanted to explore the possibility of repairing the damaged bone using your car data. When it became clear that this was possible, we decided to proceed with the procedure. As soon as I gain enough strength, I will start physical therapy. It may take several weeks, he said. Do you want to try it? I blinked back. He grinned and clapped his hands. Very good, he exclaimed. He signaled his assistant to come over. Please allow Mr. Robinson to review the contract. The assistant handed me a tablet, and while I was reading the agreement, Dr. Steiner asked if I agreed, reminding me to blink once in agreement. I blinked once. Very good, he said. Then he instructed Alan to put an electronic signature with a thumbprint. After that, Alan signed his name, confirming that he had witnessed my consent to the procedure. Are you ready to get to work? He asked. Yes, I replied, blinking once. He smiled. Then let's get started. Don't worry. We have everything you'll need. He signaled to his assistant to wheel me out of the apartment to a large van parked in the parking lot. As we were leaving, Beth stopped us. Where are you going? She asked. Dr. Steiner looked at her before replying, Your husband has agreed to undergo a procedure that will help him walk again. Where are you taking him? She asked. How long will he be gone? We'll take him to my center in Lake Arrowhead the doctor explained. He may spend several weeks there depending on his reaction to treatment and therapy. His doctor and lawyer are aware of the situation and approved it together with your husband. 
Money is not a problem. If you don't mind, we'd like to start right now. Wait, I haven't seen any agreement, and I don't know what's going to happen. He doesn't need your consent, Mrs. Robinson, Alan replied. He is disabled, but not incapacitated. He understands everything and has given his consent. Don't you want your husband to get well? Yes, of course I do, she replied with a note of guilt in her voice. Can I at least come to him? she asked. Perhaps after the procedure, when he is ready to receive visitors, you can come, Dr. Steiner replied. It would be better if you stay put for now. We will contact you soon. Now is the time to say goodbye and wish your husband good health. Beth came up to me and kissed me on the lips. Take care of yourself, my love. Let me know when I can visit you, okay? I couldn't speak, but I was seething with anger. Dr. Steiner and his assistant walked me to the van. As soon as I was seated inside, the assistant got behind the wheel, and we drove off. As we were driving away, I saw Beth standing in the parking lot. I couldn't understand her thoughts, but I felt a sense of relief, as if I had just been rescued from a dangerous situation. A few hours later, we arrived at the place, and I was escorted to a luxurious room, where a team of nurses began to prepare me for the procedure. I hope you don't mind, Tim, but I think it's better to start right now, Dr. Steiner informed me before instructing the nurses to prepare me for surgery. As soon as he is ready, please take him to the operating room, he ordered the nurses. You're in good hands, Tim. I'll see you in the operating room, he assured me before leaving. Soon I was stripped, washed, and dressed in a hospital gown, leaving my back naked. Then they put me on a stretcher and took me to the operating room, where three sturdy orderlies carefully laid me face down on the table. The anesthesiologist administered anesthesia, and the last sound I heard before I lost consciousness was Dr. Steiner's exclamation, Oh my God! When I woke up, I was still lying face down but now I was securely fixed in a device that did not allow me to move. I woke up with a tube in my throat, an IV in my hand, and a blood pressure monitor on my right arm. Suddenly the device moved, and I found myself looking at Dr. Steiner's face. You're awake, he said. Good. The operation was successful. We will have to immobilize you for a few days to ensure proper healing. We had to replace a lot of things. You may feel tingling or itching in your back, but that's okay. The implants are working properly, so the nurses and I will be watching you closely. The device you are connected to will rotate your body periodically, so don't worry. Try to relax for now, okay? We'll talk about it in a few days. With these words, he assessed my vital signs, gave instructions to the nurses, and left the room. Relax? What other choice did I have? I couldn't get rid of the constant tingling in my back, which was incredibly annoying. I also felt itchy and wanted to scratch, but unfortunately I couldn't. Despite the disappointment, it was a relief to finally feel something after being numb more than a year ago. Later in the evening, two nurses came to help me take a bath. I was surprised to feel their hands washing my legs, buttocks, and back. It was a shocking realization that I could feel their touch. When they turned me over to wash the front of my body, I could see them clearly. Both nurses were young and attractive, which took me by surprise. One of them had shoulder-length blonde hair, and the other was a brunette. When they bathed me, I experienced sensations that I had not experienced for a very long time. Although I couldn't move my head, I could see a smile slowly spreading across their faces. The blonde looked at me and noticed, I'm not a doctor, but it seems that something is going on here and grinned. They giggled and continued to work. After finishing their work, they left the room, but not before saying a few words of encouragement to me. I've been in this device for four days. Every day followed the same scenario. Every morning I had an x-ray, after which the nurses came and massaged my arms and legs. Later in the day, I was thoroughly wiped with a washcloth. Over time, I began to notice that I was feeling more and more what was happening to me. On the fourth day, Dr. Steiner came into the room and examined me carefully. Sitting down next to me, he took out a pin and quickly pricked my leg. I felt pain and made a sound, unable to speak because of the tube in my throat. Dr. Steiner looked at me and asked, Did you feel it? After blinking once, I tried to nod my head but realized that she was still immobilized by the straps. 
he smiled and praised me for my success. Then he asked me to wiggle my toes, which I succeeded in doing. Then he asked me to move my fingers, which I did without hesitation. Impressed, he carefully examined my x-rays and called the nurses, deciding that it was time to release me from the machine. They removed the tube from my throat, took out the catheter, disconnected all the tubes, and unhooked me from the machine. Then they put me on a gurney and brought me to the ward, where they laid me on a bed. The doctor discussed my progress with the nurses and then sat down next to me. I am very pleased with how well you are feeling, he said. Now we have to start physical therapy, starting with exercises that you can do in bed. I want to be careful and not put too much strain on your back yet. He handed me a cup with a straw and told me to drink it. The liquid in his throat was soothing. Now try to say something, he asked when I swallowed. Wow, I managed to mutter. He chuckled slightly and nodded. That's good, he commented. How are you feeling? I replied in a weak voice. Like a new person. Tears welled up in my eyes. For the first time since the accident, I was able to speak and express my thoughts. He handed me a napkin and gently wiped away my tears. I know this is a very emotional moment for you, Tim. Just calm down now. Don't burden yourself too much. Your back still needs time to heal, but it looks like the implants are doing their job. I am worried that you may have lost muscle mass due to the accident, so we will apply a diet and exercise program to help you regain muscle strength. And now let me introduce you to the team that will help you. With a wave of his hand, a group of young women entered the room. This is Angela, your nutritionist, he said. Ingrid will be your physical therapist, he added, pointing to a muscular blonde with short hair who nodded in agreement. And Linda will be your day nurse, he said, pointing to a petite woman with short dark hair. And this is Kirsten, your night nurse, he introduced, pointing to a tall, red-haired woman. Her eyes sparkled as she greeted me. I managed to say, nice to meet you. Dr. Steiner assured me, if you need anything, don't hesitate to ask. We are here around the clock. He asked the women to come out for a minute, and then turned back to me. Tim, I need to discuss something with you. This is a sensitive topic, so please let me know if you feel uncomfortable. During the procedure, I noticed damage to the rectum and took samples in this area. I'm not here to judge, but I was curious. No, I stuttered, feeling awkward. I see, he said, noticing my tears. So, you were bullied? I managed to nod and tears rolled down my cheeks. He gently wiped my face before speaking again. I am obliged to inform the authorities about this. In this state, bullying people with disabilities is considered a criminal offense. This is also classified as a hate crime. I've collected evidence samples that are being analyzed in the lab, including DNA. Do you know who is responsible for this? Yes, I replied quietly. Is your wife involved in this? He asked. I'm not sure. She wasn't around when it happened, I replied. I understand, he said. Are you ready to name the culprit? I nodded. Yes, I confirmed. Good. As soon as we get the results, I will inform the authorities. In the meantime, I'll arrange a meeting with a psychologist for you. Thank you, I said. You're welcome, he replied. Now let's focus on helping you recover and recover, okay? There was a device installed at the head of my bed that allowed me to do weight exercises lying down, but Dr. Steiner advised me not to use it right away. Instead, during the first week, I was ordered to do arm exercises, and a simulator was brought for leg exercises. Ingrid, who guided me during the exercises, turned out to be an experienced therapist because she counted the cadence. The coming weeks will undoubtedly bring you difficulties. It is unknown which will be more difficult, physical or emotional recovery. I appreciate that you trust me enough to discuss your experiences, and I urge you to seek justice for those who mistreated you. Their actions were illegal and should be reviewed. Remember that I am here to support you, and you can contact me at any time. The session ended, and I was taken back to the ward. 
A few days later, Dr. Steiner entered my room, accompanied by two men in dark suits. The coming weeks will undoubtedly bring you difficulties. It is unknown which will be more difficult, physical or emotional recovery. I appreciate that you trust me enough to discuss your experiences, and I urge you to seek justice for those who mistreated you. Their actions were illegal and should be reviewed. Remember that I am here to support you, and you can contact me at any time. The session ended, and I was taken back to the ward. A few days later, Dr. Steiner entered my room, accompanied by two men in dark suits. I saw that Alan was present with them. After escorting the nurses out of my room, the doctor sat down next to me. Tim, these gentlemen have come to discuss your situation at home. I also took the initiative to call your lawyer. I hope you don't mind, he said. Of course, I replied. Alan looked surprised to hear my voice. You look healthier, Tim, he remarked, standing by my bed. I smiled and held out my hand to shake. Shocked, he shook my hand in return. Thank you. I feel much better now. I can even feed myself. Dr. Steiner commented. He is developing well. If the situation continues to improve, he will become stronger than before the accident. Alan replied, This is great news. Turning to me, he said, Tim, this is Agent Smith and Agent Jones from the state police. They need to hear your testimony. Are you ready to talk to them? Of course. The three men sat down, and Agent Smith took out a dictaphone asking, Mr. Robinson, do you mind if we record this conversation? Not at all, I replied. The next hour was spent recording and questioning as I talked about the abuse. I had suffered over the past four months at the hands of a man I once considered a friend, Don Ekins. I had to go through this trauma for the third time, and it was just as embarrassing and painful. So, you're saying that Mr. Ekins is the one who attacked you several times? Agent Smith asked. Yes, I confirmed. I have a sample taken from Mr. Robinson, as well as an analysis, Dr. Steiner added. We're going to have to present this as evidence, Agent Smith said. Dr. Steiner nodded in agreement. Mr. Robinson, is this the same Don Ekins who works at the law firm of McMaster and Williams? I confirmed. Yes, that's him. He continued. Does your wife also work at this firm? I replied. Yes, it works. Are you saying that they had an affair during this period? I replied. Yes, it is. Was she present during the attack? Agent Smith asked. I shook my head. She was in the apartment, but not in the same room, I explained. She seemed to think he was helping me in some way. The agent nodded. Regardless, we will have to involve her as an accomplice. It's hard to believe that she was completely unaware of what was happening, even if she wasn't physically in the same room. Tim, are you sure about this? I know Don Akins personally, and I find it hard to believe that he could do something like this. Perhaps you don't know him as well as you think, I remarked rhetorically. You have Dr. Steiner's report and a sample. I can't explain it, he admitted. Are you planning to divorce your wife? Absolutely, I confirmed. Okay, I'll start processing the documents and we'll discuss them before filing. I also need a restraining order and I definitely don't want them in my apartment. Your apartment is now being treated as a potential crime scene, Agent Smith said. How long will Mr. Robinson be here? He asked Dr. Steiner. It's hard to say, the doctor replied. He may have to stay here for at least another five weeks and possibly longer, depending on his response to treatment and therapy. Very good, Smith nodded. At least he'll be safe for a while. Then he turned to his partner and ordered, Get a search warrant for the Robinsons' apartment and arrest warrants for Mrs. Robinson and Mr. Akins. The second agent nodded and left the room. Then Smith turned his attention to me. I want to inform you, Mr. Robinson, he said, that we will charge your wife as an accomplice. If necessary, are you ready to testify against her in court? I answered with a simple, yes. Smith nodded understandingly. At that moment, Jones returned and signaled that everything was ready. The warrants will be prepared as soon as we return to the office. All right, Smith said. 
He then assembled his equipment and the sample he received from Dr. Steiner. Mr. Robinson will be in touch, he said. I hope everything will be fine with you. Thank you, I replied. When they left, Alan came up to me. Tim, these accusations of yours are very serious. Don could lose everything, his job, his license, maybe even his marriage. Are you absolutely sure about this? I'm absolutely sure, Alan. To be honest, I don't feel any sympathy if he loses everything. In fact, given his actions, he should lose everything. I hope you will support me in this. Please let me know if this is not the case and I will look for another lawyer. Tim, I'm on your side, but I find it hard to believe. I met with his wife, visited their house and saw no signs that he could have done such a stupid thing. Unfortunately, he did it, I stated. Can I also sue him? Alan replied, There should be no obstacles in our state as attachment alienation lawsuits are allowed. I will investigate further, but keep in mind that such cases often do not lead to significant results. I'm sorry, Tim. I was not aware of this situation. It's not your fault at all. I couldn't tell anyone about it. After saying goodbye to us, he left. I felt relieved knowing that measures would be taken. The following weeks flew by unnoticed. Ingrid quickly put me on my feet. At first, she made me walk on a treadmill. Then she moved on to strength training. Angela put me on a diet high in protein and fiber, and I began to notice how my muscle mass was increasing. While the authorities were gathering evidence against Don and Beth, Alan decided to wait for Beth's arrest before handing her the divorce papers. Agents Smith and Jones, as well as state prosecutors, visited me repeatedly to gather more information about the attacks and confirmed that the DNA belonged to Don. In addition, Alan hired a private investigator to collect evidence of Don and Beth's adultery, which was not difficult to find, given how openly they conducted their affair. Katie, Don's wife, seemed completely oblivious to their actions as she worked at night, allowing them to do their illegal business while she was not at home. She slept during the day while they were at work. When Alan had gathered enough evidence and completed the necessary paperwork, he came to discuss it with me. He intended to file for divorce on the grounds of adultery, neglect, and cruelty. He had a lot of photos, videos, and audio recordings confirming his correctness. I didn't want to see or hear any more evidence of their betrayal, because I'd already seen enough of it all my life. He also had documents for Don, and he intended to file a case against the company they both worked for, since Beth was technically under his command and Don had clearly violated company rules. In addition, he intended to file an application against Don with the State Bar Association, citing various ethical violations. I couldn't help but notice that Beth had never asked about my well-being or visited me during my stay at the institution, presumably because she was busy with her affair with Don. But I accepted that sooner or later this situation would end, and that's how it happened. Two weeks later, the authorities arrived at the firm and arrested all those involved. Allen's procedural server was there to deliver all the necessary paperwork. The media was notified by my lawyer, who filmed two scammers being escorted to police cars. The firm, overwhelmed by the accusations and evidence against Don, quickly settled most of our claims with Allen. They also fired these two people and reported Don to the State Bar Association. She found out about the arrest the same day when Don called her from the county jail and informed her that he was in custody and had to appear at a hearing to post bail. Agent Smith and Jones, as well as Dr. Steiner, escorted me to the courthouse for the hearing. Katie noticed me as I was being led into the building and rushed over to me, asking Dr. Steiner about my condition. I feel better, I replied, watching her reaction. It's been a year since she last heard my words. Haven't you heard? For four months, your husband was constantly bullied. You've been having an affair with Don all this time. Didn't you guess what your lover was doing to your husband? Oh my God, she exclaimed. I really had no idea, Tim, I swear it. I even filed for divorce from Beth and sued Don for pushing away my affection, if you want to do the same. I can give you the contact information of my lawyer. I will definitely divorce this jerk, she said. When we entered the courtroom, we saw the sheriffs bringing in Don and Beth, 
both dressed in orange jumpsuits with chained arms and legs connected by a chain at their waist. Both looked disheveled. The state's attorney asked them to be taken into custody without bail, citing the fact that Don might escape, and a restraining order was issued against Beth. The prosecutor mentioned my treatment and filing for divorce, expressing fears that Don might harm me. After reviewing the documents, the judge decided to keep them in custody without the right to bail until the upcoming hearing scheduled for next week. As Don and Beth were being escorted out, Beth spotted me at the back of the courtroom. Her eyes widened when she saw that I raised my hand with my middle finger outstretched. After Agent Smith and Jones took me away on wheels, Katie caught up with me and stopped them to talk. Tim, I'm so sorry that all this happened. I had no idea, she said sincerely. I calmed her down by saying, It's okay, Katie. When she asked how long I would be gone, I just shrugged and replied, I don't know for sure, maybe a few more weeks. They did a great job. Now I can walk a little bit. It's wonderful. Please keep me in touch and let me know about your progress, Katie said. We have to go, miss, Agent Smith interjected. Katie nodded and stood up. Take care of yourself, Tim, she added. Thanks, Katie, I replied as Agent Smith led me to the van. When we returned to the center, I was taken to the physiotherapy room where Ingrid was waiting for me. It's time to start. She offered me extra exercises to make up for my lateness. By the end of the lesson, I felt pain, but I was happy. Kirsten stayed behind to check on my progress and finish the paperwork. When she finished her work, she came to my bed, made sure I was comfortable, and then sat down and studied me carefully. A worried expression appeared on her face. Is everything okay? I asked. You look worried. I just wanted to ask you something, she admitted. What? Do you find me attractive? She asked. Absolutely, I replied. I think you're a wonderful girl and a damn good nurse. Why have you never bothered me during your stay here? She asked. I was wondering if I had done something that upset you, or maybe you didn't find me attractive. I smiled before answering. Actually, I really like you. But firstly, I'm still married, and secondly, I'm just learning to move around again. For a whole year, I couldn't even speak. What about your other patients? You are my only patient, was the quiet reply. Dr. Steiner was selective in choosing patients for the night shift. I see. So Dr. Steiner is not only a medical genius and a miracle worker, but also a bit of a matchmaker? She grinned. Sometimes it happens, she admitted. It just so happens, Kirsten, that I'm not indifferent to shy, beautiful, red-haired girls. And coincidentally, I'm going through a divorce right now, I confessed. Her smile widened and her eyes shone. Can I kiss you goodnight? She asked. I nodded in agreement. When she bent down, her lips met mine in a gentle kiss. The tenderness quickly turned into a passionate embrace. When she pulled away, I felt a deep connection. I will always be there for you, she assured me. If you need anything, feel free to call me. Despite the fact that she was aware of my physical limitations, she expressed a desire to just be with me. I promise, I replied. Smiling, she quietly left the room. After reflecting on her words, I fell asleep, and all night long bright visions of red-haired angels danced in my mind. In the days that followed, Ingrid pushed me to the limit, which led to significant progress. I was surprised to find that I can walk long distances on a treadmill and lift weights during workouts. X-rays showed that my new vertebrae were functioning better than expected, and the implants had successfully repaired most of the damaged nerves. Kirsten visited me regularly in the evenings, watched TV with me while lying on the bed, or had deep conversations. While watching movies, we often shared a bowl of popcorn and hugged, putting it on our laps. Our evenings always ended with hot kisses, and I felt like a schoolboy on a date with the most beautiful girl in school. And not only that, but also that I was beginning to fall deeply in love with her. When Agent Smith and Jones arrived to take me to Beth and Don's trial, I no longer needed a wheelchair, but Dr. Steiner insisted that I use it anyway, 
so as not to accidentally injure myself. He accompanied me not only to witness the injuries I had sustained, but also to ensure my safe return. I took a seat behind the prosecutor, and Dr. Steiner sat next to me. Beth and Don entered the courtroom, sat next to their lawyer, exchanged glances with me, and then had a quiet conversation with their lawyer. Katie was sitting behind them and looked unhappy. The jurors selected the day before were already in their seats when the judge entered the courtroom. The bailiff ordered everyone to stand up, and I stood up, leaning on the railing in front of me. When I stood up, Don and Beth looked shocked. When the judge entered the courtroom, he told us to sit down, and we all obeyed. Dr. Steiner quietly asked me if I was okay, and I nodded in response. The judge began the trial by reading out a long list of charges, noting that Don and Beth had pleaded not guilty. After the opening statements of both sides, the judge turned to the prosecution lawyer who called me as the first witness. Accompanied by Dr. Steiner, I went to the witness chair, trying not to trip on the way. After I sat down, Dr. Steiner returned to his seat. Don and Beth exchanged surprised glances, and their shock deepened when I started talking after the bailiff's oath. The prosecutor came up to me, praised my recovery, and then began to ask about what had happened. I understood his tactics when he asked these questions. He explained to the jury my physical condition before I underwent treatment at Dr. Steiner's clinic. Most of the questions related to my home life, in particular how Beth tried to take care of me but couldn't, and how Katie organized home medical care to help me during the day. The prosecutor asked, Has your wife ever tried to satisfy your emotional needs? To which I replied, No, I didn't try. Then the prosecutor asked, Has she ever tried to satisfy your physical needs? To which I replied, No, she didn't try. Would she have succeeded? He asked. I shook my head. No, I didn't feel anything from the neck down. I see, he replied. Has she ever shown physical affection or spent quality time with you? Like reading a book or watching TV? I thought about this question before admitting that I don't remember her doing anything like that. She kissed me on the cheek from time to time, but that was all, I explained. Did she help take care of you? Did she feed you, help you swim or go to the toilet? At first she tried, but it was difficult for her to do it. When did Mr. Aiken start interfering? Almost from the beginning, I replied. Were you and Mr. Aiken's friends before the incident? The prosecutor asked. Yes, there were. They were our neighbors and we spent time together before my accident. I understand. So you weren't surprised by his presence in your apartment? No, I considered him a friend. They often came to our place and sometimes we drank beer or had dinner together. The prosecutor said, You mentioned that he and your wife made love in your apartment. When did it start? I replied, I don't know for sure. It may have started when I was in the hospital, but I can't confirm that. I don't have any proof of that. He often comforted her when she cried in his presence. I think I first heard them about a month after returning from the hospital. The prosecutor asked, Did you hear that? And I replied, Yes. The sounds of their kisses and moans filled the room, resembling passionate kisses. Remembering that, Beth wiped away her tears. Then I heard them indulging in intimate pleasures in the place where our bed once stood. The prosecutor asked the question, What happened next? He came to my room to make fun of me while she was taking a shower. One day he brought a monitor, saying that it was so that I could watch him satisfy my wife. Beth and the jury gasped at the revelation. Your Honor, the prosecutor said when the bailiff brought a cart with a large monitor into the hall. Here is the monitor and box that Mr. Robinson is talking about, which turned out to be a digital video recorder. The surveillance system included two cameras, one in the master bedroom and the other in the room where he was staying. We looked at several hours of recordings made by the device. Then the prosecutor turned to me. Is it true that Mr. Akins used this device so that you could observe his intimate relations with your wife? He asked. Yes. I replied quietly. 
Beth looked at Dawn with an expression of disbelief. You are a disgusting person, she exclaimed. The judge banged his gavel, calling the court to order. Beth paused, giving the prosecutor the opportunity to continue. Did you know that Mr. Aikens installed a camera in both your room and the master bedroom? He asked. I shook my head. It was news to me. No, sir, I didn't know, I replied. How did your wife react to the monitor? She thought it was great, deciding that this way I could watch sports on TV, I explained. Was it around this time that the abuse started? He asked. Yes, that's right, I confirmed. Could you describe the usual sequence of events? The prosecutor asked. After Don and my wife were having fun, he would come into my room and turn off the monitor. Then he bullied me, I explained. Was your wife present at these incidents? The prosecutor continued to inquire. As far as I know, no. It looks like he was finishing around the same time she was finishing taking a shower, I explained. She often came into my room and expressed gratitude that she had a friend like Don who helped take care of me. How often did this happen? It happened about two to three times a week for about four months, I told the prosecutor. The jury reacted with a sigh, and some even looked at Beth and Don with hatred. Beth looked down at the table, and Don remained impassive, staring straight ahead. According to your calculations, did this happen about 35 times in total? The prosecutor asked. That's about it, yes, I said. Did you know that Mr. Akins was recording the time he spent in your room? He asked me. No. Addressing the jury, the prosecutor said, Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Akins recorded 36 times on this device how he bullied Mr. Robinson. After taking a short pause to let the information sink in, he asked, With friends like that, who needs enemies? The defense attorney quickly objected and the judge upheld the objection. I have no more questions for this witness, he said, but I reserve the right to call Mr. Robinson to testify. All right, the judge replied. Mr. Green, you can begin the interrogation, the lawyer ordered. Green remained seated at his desk and made eye contact before addressing me. Mr. Robinson, I want to express my sympathy for the injuries you have sustained and wish you a speedy recovery, he said. Thank you, I replied. Then he asked, Have you ever informed Mr. Akins that you disapprove of his alleged actions? I wasn't able to do it. I was completely incapacitated and couldn't speak. So the answer is no, he said. That's because I couldn't, I replied, feeling annoyed. You also did not inform anyone about the situation, not even your spouse. Isn't that right? He asked. Now I was furious. That's because I was completely incapacitated and couldn't do it, idiot, I shouted, banging my fist on the sturdy wooden railing in front of me. There was silence for a moment. No one spoke or moved. When I took my hand away, I noticed that I accidentally hit the railing with more force than I intended. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I let my emotions get the better of me. He warned me not to repeat this behavior. I nodded in understanding. It's all for this witness, Green said. The judge signaled for me to leave the podium, and Dr. Steiner escorted me to my seat. Subsequently, the prosecutor called Dr. Steiner to testify where he told the court in detail about my injuries and the severity of my disability. He spoke in detail about the discovery of significant damage and how he began collecting samples for testing and proof. After carrying out the necessary procedures to repair the damage, he also spoke in detail about the operation and reported on the progress of my recovery. Do you agree that these injuries could only have occurred if Mr. Robinson had been attacked? The prosecutor asked. Yes. It is, Dr. Steiner confirmed. It also explains the evidence found. Thank you. The prosecutor thanked and turned to the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, the sample has been checked by the state, and further analysis, including DNA analysis, confirms with 99% certainty that the source is the defendant, Mr. Donald Akins. He turned to the judge. That's all I have for this witness, Your Honor. Your witness, Mr. Green, the judge announced. Thank you, Dr. Steiner. You're the director of the Arrowhead Institute for Advanced Medical Research, right? Yes, that's right, he replied. 
You do innovative research at your institute, don't you? Asked Green. Yes, Dr. Steiner replied, smoothly switching to his native German as he often did. Green took out a piece of paper and began to read aloud. Each of us has our own defense mechanisms that we rely on in difficult times. Sometimes we turn to an alternate version of ourselves, almost like an alter ego. This alter ego can manifest itself in different ways. For example, a normally reserved and modest person may suddenly show traits of loudness, arrogance, and authority. If someone unfamiliar with this person's behavior witnesses it, his perception will change dramatically, he read an excerpt from the book. Then he looked up at Dr. Steiner. You also mentioned the inner beast that lives in each of us. Judging by your work, you have found a way to awaken this inner beast to confront certain problems. Is it true? He asked. Have you worked with Mr. Bill Dalton in the past and helped him uncover his supposed inner beast? Green asked. Yes, I worked with Mr. Dalton, Dr. Steiner confirmed. But the details of my work with him are confidential. Then Green asked, Is it true that Mr. Dalton's house exploded towards the end of his treatment? The prosecutor objected, considering the question inappropriate. Green continued to insist, addressing the judge. Your Honor, I consider this information extremely important. We all saw how Mr. Robinson reacted. If you don't mind, I think there's a connection here, Green said. I'll allow it for now, Mr. Green, the judge replied. But please get down to business quickly. Of course, Your Honor. Thank you, Green replied, and turned to Dr. Steiner. Do you know what happened to Mr. Dalton's house? He asked. I remember hearing about it on the news, Dr. Steiner replied. I also remember that the police mentioned that Mrs. Dalton and her partner were engaged in the production of prohibited substances using hazardous materials. I don't understand what this has to do with this case. Police reports indicate that Mrs. Dalton was seen running away from home and claiming that she saw a monster, Green claims. The reason for the incident was the banned substances that she and her lover were making, Dr. Steiner suggested. Your Honor, this information is not relevant to this case. The prosecutor objected. The judge agreed with this and asked the defense to abandon this line of questioning. Very good, Your Honor, Mr. Green replied. I have no more questions for the witness. With these words, the judge dismissed Dr. Steiner, and the trial continued. The prosecutor then questioned the state agents who searched my apartment, and both confirmed that they had found evidence. After that, the nurses who worked at home testified that they noticed traces of physical cruelty, recording their observations in the records. Unfortunately, the nursing home did not follow up on these messages, allowing them to slip through bureaucratic loopholes. With your consent, I would like to show a video of Mr. Robinson being bullied. Of course, the judge replied. The prosecutor addressed the jury, stating, Ladies and gentlemen, what you are about to witness is shocking, he continued. I don't enjoy it, but it's important for you to understand the scale of the suffering that Mr. Robinson has been experiencing for a long time. After that, he started playing the video on the monitor. The prosecutor then turned on the video, causing the jury to flinch when watching the disturbing footage. At some point, the prosecutor paused the video and zoomed in on the image. Dear jurors, there should be no doubt about who is responsible for this terrible act committed against a man who once considered him his friend, he announced. While the jury was examining the evidence, tears of shame were streaming down my face. The prosecutor stopped the video recording again, watching the shocked expressions on the faces of the jurors. I'm concluding my arguments, he said dismissively. Mr. Green, you can present your defense, the judge ordered as soon as the prosecutor took his seat. Green stood up and called Beth to testify. Mrs. Robinson, he began, is it true that you had an intimate relationship with Mr. Aikens? She nodded, her voice barely above a whisper. Yes, it is. Why did you do that? He asked. My husband, Tim was seriously injured and I felt lost and hopeless, she explained. Mr. Aikens was by my side when I needed support. 
Yes, we had a physical relationship, but it was the only way. Just physical contact, nothing more. Did you know about what Mr. Aikens did to your husband? Asked Green. No, I had no idea, she admitted. If you knew, did you try to intervene to prevent his actions? Green asked. Yes, I would try, Mrs. Robinson confirmed. Thank you for your testimony. That's all for today. Your turn, Mr. Johnson, he said, sitting down in an armchair. The prosecutor got up and walked over to the monitor, pointing to the image on the screen where Beth and I were clearly visible. Mrs. Robinson, he began, you mentioned that you were unaware of the abuse against your husband. Is it so? Yes, she replied. Look at his face on the video, the prosecutor urged. The pain and shame were clearly visible on the video. Can the court really believe that you could see your husband, with whom you have been married for three years, in such a state, and not understand that something is wrong? It didn't occur to me at the time, she replied. Before Mrs. Aikens hired housekeepers, did you ever take care of your husband, feed him, or clean up after him? The prosecutor asked. I tried, but I wasn't very good at it, she admitted. And after that, have you made any attempts to help? No, she whispered. Why? The prosecutor asked. I wasn't sure. I thought Don was helping him, and I was at a loss what to do, she replied. So, you actually abandoned him, didn't you? The prosecutor pressed, prompting Green's objections. I withdraw the question. You mentioned that your relationship with Mr. Aikens was purely physical, right? He continued. Yes, she confirmed. And you also stated in your testimony that you still have feelings for your husband, is that right? Yes, she replied. Johnson took an audio recorder and a folder out of his briefcase and then returned to the dock. Your Honor, he began. I have here a report prepared by Samuel Jenkins, a private investigator hired by Mr. Robinson's lawyer, he said, handing the report to the judge. A copy of this report and the accompanying audio recording was also provided to Mr. Green, as indicated in the affidavit. The report contains details of a conversation recorded during dinner between the defendants shortly after Mr. Robinson entered Arrowhead. May I play the audio recording for the jury with your permission? The judge nodded in agreement. Johnson then pressed a button on the recorder, allowing the courtroom to listen to the conversation between Beth and Don. Have you thought about our conversation? Don's voice asked. I've been thinking about it, and I have to say that I'm interested, Beth replied. And you? I have to admit that the last few months with you have been amazing, Beth admitted. Much better than my life with Tim. Do you think we can do it? Beth asked. Absolutely, Don assured her. I'm a lawyer. I can manipulate the judge to do whatever I want. Declaring Tim a ward of the state will be easy. He can't take care of himself, and obviously you can't take care of him either. To be honest, the very thought of it disgusts me, Beth admitted. Feeding him, wiping his drool, changing diapers, it makes me sick. I need a real man like you. We both know Steiner is hopeless, Don said. All the doctors say that he will remain disabled forever. Once we recognize him as incapacitated, we will be able to access his settlement and live like royalty in Costa Rica. Isn't that better than messing with Timmy here? Yes, it will be so. What about Katie? What's wrong with her? He replied, Our relationship with her has not been the best for a long time. She wants children but I don't want that. And to be honest, her constant nagging is starting to bother me. I just need to make sure that you don't change your mind and confess your love to him as soon as we start implementing our plan. That's not going to happen. I love you, and only you. The prosecutor paused the recording and turned to Beth. My heart sank when I realized that I had been betrayed. So you and your partner decided to declare your husband incapacitated, take his money to pay compensation, and run away to Costa Rica together. Mrs. Robinson, have you been honest with your lover? Were you honest in court? Please explain so that I can decide whether to charge you with perjury or not, the prosecutor demanded. Tears streamed down her face as she realized that she was deceiving herself. 
I do not know, she sobbed, torn between feelings for her lover and her husband. She begged, please forgive me, Tim. I shook my head and turned away, unable to look into her eyes. Johnson said with disgust, I'm done with this witness, and left. After dismissing the judge, Green called Don to testify. So, Mr. Akins, Green began when Don was sworn in. We've all seen the video of you and Mr. Robinson. No one denies what happened. I have just one question for you. Has Mr. Robinson ever made it clear that he disagrees with your actions? Don's face twisted into a grin as he replied, Not once. Green thanked him and turned away, instructing Johnson, who was already standing, to begin cross-examination. Mr. Akins, Johnson began. Did you graduate from Harvard Law School? Johnson asked. Yes, Don replied proudly. And you were the best in your class? Johnson continued. Yes, Don confirmed. You are considered the best trial lawyer in your firm, right? Johnson asked. Green objected, stating, Appropriate, Your Honor. The judge allowed Johnson to continue, saying, Go on, Mr. Johnson. Johnson then stated, Your Honor, I intend to show that Mr. Akins not only knows the law, but also knew that Mr. Robinson could not refuse consent. He looked at Don again. You knew Mr. Robinson was disabled, didn't you? Don sighed but said nothing. Answer me, Johnson demanded. Yes, I knew, Don finally admitted. And you knew that people with Mr. Robinson's disabilities are considered unable to give consent under state law, right? Johnson pressed. Yes, I suppose so, Don replied. Johnson looked at him with disgust and then left. I'm done with this witness, he said. Are there any other witnesses, Mr. Green? The judge asked. Green shook his head and replied, No, Your Honor, I'm leaving my arguments. The judge nodded and announced, Very good. We will take a 15-minute break and reconvene to make our closing arguments. With a bang of the hammer, everyone left the courtroom. As we were leaving, Dr. Steiner handed me a cup of water and asked, How are you holding up? I took a sip and answered, Everything will be fine. He patted me on the shoulder reassuringly. Johnson, noticing my disappointment, turned to me and said, I'm sorry you had to go through all this. I think we left a lasting impression on the jury. We'll find out soon enough. The trial is coming to an end. Tim, don't lose heart. Thanks. When the break was over, everyone returned to the courtroom. Don, Beth, and Mr. Green looked less confident than before. Katie, on the other hand, looked furious. It was new information for her. When the judge returned, the bailiff ordered us to stand up. Mr. Green, you can now make your closing remarks, the judge announced. Green stood up and addressed the jury. Dear jurors, this case is difficult and difficult for all its participants. Despite all your prejudices, we sincerely wish Mr. Robinson well. It is recognized that the brutality occurred with the participation of Mr. Robinson, and we do not dispute this fact. But the crux of the matter is the issue of consent. Mr. Robinson himself testified under oath that he never told our client that consent had not been given. Mrs. Robinson was unaware of any wrongdoing and remained unaware of the attack. From now on, you have to justify my clients on all counts. Thank you. With these words, he sat down in his seat, and the judge signaled Johnson to make his closing remarks. Upon entering the courtroom, he turned on the monitor, which displayed an alarming image of Don attacking me. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want to express my gratitude to you for your dedication and service throughout the trial. I understand what an emotional blow this has caused to each of you. Despite the defense's attempts to confuse the facts by claiming that Mr. Robinson never explicitly stated his disagreement, one glaring question remains open. Mr. Robinson, who is disabled and cannot speak, was defenseless against those who wanted to use him to their advantage. In this state, it is considered that people with disabilities like him cannot give or refuse consent. Mr. Green knows that. The defendant Akins, a Harvard-educated lawyer, was aware of this legal situation. 
They confessed to their illegal actions against Mr. Robinson, as evidenced by video and audio recordings. It is clear that they conspired to falsely declare Mr. Robinson incapacitated in order to illegally seize his property and flee the country. Regarding the allegations against Beth Robinson, what decision will you make? We find the defendant Beth Robinson not guilty of complicity in the abuse of a disabled person, Your Honor, but guilty of all other charges, the foreman announced. The judge silently accepted the verdict. Very good, he announced, after which he turned to the defendants in a ferocious tone. Over the years, I've seen a lot in this courtroom, but nothing as shocking and terrifying as what I saw today. Both of you are absolutely disgusting. You have not only betrayed your marriages, but also tarnished the reputation of the legal profession. That is why I am passing the harshest sentences possible under the law. Mr. Akins, as a lawyer and a representative of the court, your conduct carries a heavy penalty. This includes 12 years for each of the 36 counts of abuse, as well as an additional 20 years for committing a hate crime. I also added another eight years for conspiracy to commit fraud. Mrs. Robinson, I disagree with the jury's decision of innocence. It's hard for me to understand how a person with two brain cells could not know about the bullying your husband was subjected to. Regardless, I will respect the verdict. But I am imposing the maximum penalty for criminal neglect, negligence, and conspiracy to defraud, which according to state rules is 15 years in prison, this means that you will be eligible for parole in 10 years, he said. Lifting the hammer, Green turned to the judge. Your Honor, he began, Mrs. Robinson has just informed me that the divorce papers have already been filed and she would like to speak with Mr. Robinson before she is taken into custody. Do you mind, Mr. Robinson? the judge asked. I can give her a couple of minutes, Your Honor, I replied. The judge nodded in agreement. Very good, he announced, then banged the gavel and removed the court. Beth came up to me as the assistants were preparing to take Don out. You look good, Tim, she remarked. I just wanted to apologize for everything that happened. I had no idea what he was doing to you, and if I had known, I would have done everything in my power to stop it. I think you've managed to convince the jury of that, I said. But I agree with the judge. It's hard to believe. You are not stupid. In any case, you will have 15 years to think about it. Is there anything else? Yes, she replied. I wanted to tell you that I signed the divorce papers and I'm not going to dispute them. This is my latest news. I will try my best to erase you from my memory. Is there anything else? I know you may not trust me, but you are very dear to me, she confessed. I just needed to say it before they took me away. You're right. I don't believe you. But thanks for sharing with me. I replied. It's probably better if you leave. These assistants don't look too pleased, I advised. Okay, goodbye, Tim, she said, turned and walked away, tears streaming down her face. I didn't have any feelings for her at that moment. When I got up, Katie came up to me. Tim, how are you feeling? You look much better than the last time I saw you. I'm much better, thanks to Dr. Steiner, I replied. I just wanted to apologize for what my future ex-husband did to you. I appreciate it, I replied. Did you manage to contact Alan? Yes, you did. Don's father insisted on a prenuptial agreement with a strict infidelity clause, so Alan will most likely take advantage of this. I'm glad to hear that, I said. If there's anything I can do to help, just let me know. Thank you. I may need to borrow some copies of these videos from you, she said. No problem. I'll be gone for a while, but I'm sure Alan will be able to use what he already has. And the last thing, she added, I still have the key that you gave me right after the accident. I can clean up your apartment and pick up Beth's things if you want. That would be a huge help, Katie. Thank you, I said gratefully. Good luck and see you soon, she said, and kissed me on the cheek before leaving. We watched her leave. I was shocked by Don's stupid decision to cheat on a beautiful woman. Are you done flirting with all the women? Dr. Steiner asked. I'd like to get back to work, if you don't mind. I don't mind, I replied. 
But how are we going to get back? Agent Smith assured us. We'll take care of it. After all, we brought you here. Following Dr. Steiner's instructions, I got into a wheelchair and he wheeled me to the car where we were all gathered. I was actually sitting in the car. I felt relieved when a wheelchair was brought to me. After a long day on my feet, I felt tired and in pain. Dr. Steiner took me back to the room where Kirsten was waiting for me. After dinner, she helped me get ready for bed and then went to the shower, where she changed into her sleep clothes, which were actually just a long t-shirt. When she got into bed with me, she asked, How are you feeling? Exhausted, I replied. It's been a long day. She kissed me gently and put her head on my shoulder. Yes, of course, she agreed. I understand that it was a difficult time, but it was necessary. Now you can move forward, and I will be here to support you in any way I can. I looked at her before expressing my feelings. I love you, Kirsten, I involuntarily blurted out. She responded with a sweet smile and kissed me on the lips. And I love you, Tim, she replied, resting her head on my shoulder and wrapping her arms around my chest. At that moment I felt such happiness, which I had not felt for a very long time. Eventually we both fell asleep. The next five weeks were difficult and exhausting. Don't you want to know why this happened? She asked, but I shook my head. I don't care, I told her. It's all because of greed and lust. You tricked me, plain and simple. Why does it matter anymore? Do you think you'll ever be able to forgive me? She asked. Why do all you liars think you can crawl up and beg for forgiveness? I replied. You didn't take care of me when I needed you the most. To answer your question, I will say, no, I do not intend to forgive you. Ingrid's strict training regime made me move faster and faster in every class. In addition, I visited a psychologist twice a week who helped me overcome the emotional pressure I'd been under for the past year. X-rays were taken daily to monitor the progress of treatment of my spine. Kirsten stayed by my side every night and we grew closer as we got to know each other. Finally, Dr. Steiner informed me that I had recovered enough to be discharged and sent home. Despite the fact that I was in the best shape of my life, he advised me to wait another three weeks before having an intimate relationship. He also arranged for me to come to him twice a month for the next year to have my back examined. Despite the fact that I couldn't wait to get home, I couldn't help feeling sad at the thought of leaving Kirsten. On the day of my departure, I wrote a sincere note expressing my feelings for her and gave her an open invitation to visit me whenever she pleased. Just as I finished writing, Dr. Steiner entered the room with a wheelchair, causing me to furrow my brows in confusion. Despite the fact that by this point I could walk on my own, he just shrugged and explained that this was an order. Sitting in a wheelchair, I couldn't help but feel disappointed. I hoped that I would never end up in one of these devices again. When the orderly wheeled me outside to the gathering place, I looked around the neighborhood, eagerly awaiting the arrival of the Arrowhead van. To my surprise, a dark blue Toyota RAV pulled up instead. The driver's side door opened and Kirsten, my red-haired angel of mercy, stood in front of me. She kindly came over and opened the passenger door for me, which made me speechless. I looked at Dr. Steiner, stunned by the unexpected turn of events. Kirsten has received a new assignment, to become your live-in carer. Do you have any objections to this? Absolutely none, I said, smiling. Thank you for everything. You're welcome, he said warmly. See you in a few weeks. He looked at Kirsten encouragingly. And please take good care of him, okay? I will, she replied with a smile, helping me into the car. I noticed that there were several bags stacked in the back seat of the car. So, how long have you been attached to me? I asked. It depends on how long you need me, she replied. And how long do you think it could be? I asked. By the most conservative estimates, at least 60 years old, she said. Is that okay with you? I replied, damn it. She kissed me on the lips and then drove us home. As soon as we arrived, I marked on the calendar the date when, according to Dr. Steiner, 
I would be able to start making love. Interestingly, this date coincided with the day when my divorce from Beth was finalized. Yes, we made love on the day I marked on the calendar, but it was more than just a physical connection. As Alan predicted, my lawsuit against Don for alienation of affection did not go far, but it suited me fine. Katie had already exposed him during their divorce. She stayed in their shared apartment and became Kirsten's close friend. Two years after the divorce, Katie found love again in the person of the doctor and got married. I've never visited Beth in prison, but I've heard that she goes to counseling. After serving 15 years in prison, she received parole and got a job as a waitress at a diner on the highway. Shortly after my divorce was finalized, Kirsten and I got married. It was a blessing when she announced that we were expecting our first child just a few weeks after our honeymoon in Hawaii. We had two more children, and we decided that at the moment our family is complete. Our love remained strong all these years, and when our youngest child went to college, we celebrated this event with a trip around the world. Even now, after all this time, she is still my beautiful red-haired angel of mercy. My spine has become stronger, and my overall health has improved significantly. The implants effectively repaired all the nerve damage sustained as a result of the accident. Dr. Steiner has successfully performed this surgery several times over the next decade, and it is now awaiting final approval. Reflecting on my life, I recall John Milton saying that every cloud has a silver lining. Despite a year of suffering after I was in an accident, I now have a life that surpasses all imaginable silver sides.